So, honestly, when I decided I was going to do this topic and do this in February, I realized very quickly I could come a cropper. I realized I could. The reason I could come a cropper, the reason I could, you know, have problems is because I've got to cover quite a lot of stuff for the American Aviation Doctrine in a way. And then I'm doing a whole video about American Aviation Doctrine later in the year. In fact, for the interwar period, and it the American Aviation Opera uh, Doctrine is in April. And I'm sort of thinking, well, raiding and using aircraft in a raiding fashion, that's a big part of American aviation doctrine of what to do in the early war strategy. That's a big part of some of their war plans. And then I thought, well, fudge it. If I end up repeating myself, I end up repeating myself. It's in the service of a very good cause. And, again, as I've said before on this channel, and I've said in many, many videos and lectures over the years, sometimes, as an academic, repeating yourself but from a different angle is the trick to making sure your students pick up the things, pick up the ideas you're trying to communicate them. Usually it's methodologies and it's approaches and way of quizzing topics. Um, I did love someone once who accused me of indoctrinating students and A, they got someone who's the wrong department. I'm the, I was the historian in the engineering department for starters. B, I, I, I got the students for like three hours in that department uh, a week for about eight to twelve weeks uh, over the year in their first year and then they didn't seem until it was dissertation time in their final year where I was going, so let's let's just talk about how we're going to do this, shall we? Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't think I was a prime candidate for doing any indoctrination in that scenario. And also, have you if that was the case, I really do recommend you watch my channel. You will find that the only indoctrination I do is cynicism and... And that's the only thing I could be accused of doing, indoctrinating people into cynicism. Be fun. But no, mostly people, but the world tends to get people there. So anyway, so why would I need to indoctrinate people into it? It's a case of it's, it's already the case. It just happens. The world does it for you. I don't need to expend that amount of effort. But the joy of naval history and the joy of a lot of these topics is that you know, different people will find their different paths and things. Some people might find listening to the video I put on British naval aviation development and the doctrine of their films in the 1920s and 30s, the interwar period, now that might be their way into it. For others, it's going to be when we start discussing some of the operations, the, ca uh, the convoys, the uh, operations against Bismarck, the oper Taranto operations, the Norway operations, the aviation operations which are going on as part of the war. That's when the doctrine will make sense to them. And it's the same with the American Doctrine. For some, this, the raids, will be their avenue into understanding the raiding portion of Doctrine. It's how they'll understand it, because they'll want to see the full effect. Others, it's going to be the video where I talk about how it was developed. How basically Lexington and Saratoga were almost run ragged in several years, running around the Pacific going, We raid this! We raid this! We raid this! And a lot of people looking at them going, so, you're not keen on aircraft carriers? No, no, no. That's why we're using them for everything at the moment. But you don't believe in aircraft carriers? No, what we don't believe is that the current aircraft are at the level at which they can sink battleships. And please note the phraseology there, current aircraft. You know, one of the often things I, I have fun in it with is, basically, when you've got aircraft to the point at which they can reliably deliver ordnance sufficient to reliably sink a battleship at great distance, that is when the carrier has come of age. And one of the other problems you have that is that in that scenario is we also we don't really know when exactly that is because no one builds battleships because no one else is building battleships, so no one builds them. 
So we don't actually know if it's really at the point it happens or whether that's just when it's economically we're just going to build aircraft carriers and we'll keep the battleships around in case anyone else builds them. And then, of course, Stalin dies, so the Soviet Union don't build them. So then there's no reason to build them because the only real reason you have a battleship is it's your guaranteed method of killing someone else's battleship. Other things might work. They should work on paper. But when you're dealing with national defense and national security... You don't go for, should work, will work in theory. You go for, I have this method which should work, and I have this method which should work, and I'm going to have that method which should work as well. Because if any of them, one of them don't work, I still have two that might work. And ultimately, the best thing to do, uh, if everything else work, doesn't fails to work in terms of fighting battleships, your own honking great big lump of steel with massive artillery on it, will probably do the job. It might itself get smashed during the process, but you really don't mind about that, because the whole purpose of it is to stop that honking great big lump of ste uh, steel armor and artillery they have getting close enough to cause you sufficient damage to you. That damage can be going up and down your coast, destroying port facilities. Again, it's, it's one of those things which we often overthink these days, because... When we're moving around, most of us will drive from point A to point B. That's how we'll get around. I will often use the train in the UK, because if I am going into London, or into any major city, driving into them is a nightmare. I say this because someone who actually enjoys driving. I do not enjoy spending my driving the whole time crawling between 10 and 15 miles per hour, and going 1, 1st, 2nd, 3rd, yay, back to 1st. First, second. I don't enjoy that. That's the reason I also ended up with an automatic. It's literally because I passed the manual test. I drove a manual in London for a very short amount of time, as it was a car which I was using as a you know from a friend. This friend being a cousin who didn't need that car anymore as they moved abroad. And then when they said, "Well, I'm going to sell it. Do you want to buy it?" I went, "No, thank you," and went and bought an automatic because of that. It's annoying. It fundamentally really annoys you when you're driving. And because of that ease of self-movement, we tend to extrapolate and presume, because we see a lot of lorries on the road, that that is the major goods movements. And that has always been a major goods movement. But it's not. A lot of goods are moved by, via sea. And control of choke points, control of key uh, key positions around the world where trade route, uh, trade flows through, that is a powerful force to influence world events. However, however, there is an old saying that the best form of air defense is putting a battalion of infantry or squadron of armored cavalry on the enemy airfield. And that really does tend to work in terms of their ability to launch, uh, to launch and recover aircraft. However, in naval terms, it has always been, um, if Val sticks one's battleship in the middle of one's in uh, the other's port, Val tends to have won the argument. Because it literally sits there and goes, Anyone want to do anything? No? Cute. But, even with this all being the case, and all these things being understood, and all these ideas, the battleship still being very much the key part of a lot of strategy, and a lot of thought process, and a lot of development in the 1920s and 30s, there is a lot of discussions going on. And let's be honest... The next generation of battleships, the unbilt ones, Montanas, the Lions, all of those could have been a really interesting development, especially when you consider how their designs have been adapted for dealing with air attack or high-angle artillery attack. It's really interesting when you look at their, their armor profiles and designs and how that might have changed some things. But the fact is that doesn't happen. That doesn't happen. In large part because of the way aircraft carriers performed for the British in 1939 to 19, throughout the war. 
The British find the aircraft carriers very useful. They do raids, they do all sorts of things with them, and they become a primary asset. Yes, they actually have a battleship on battleship fights. The British have more than a few of those. And a lot of gun duels between cruisers and destroyers. So they have a lot of gunfights. But the aircraft carriers get proven. For the Americans, the big point, and this is the big point to really consider, is 1942. The beginning of 1942. The beginning of the war. So the Americans can place emphasis on the Essex class, or they can place emphasis on their capital ships. This is where this information is going to feed into. And it's this period of raiding where the aircraft carriers assert a strategic dominance, a strategic maneuver ability, an ability to attack with, I wouldn't say with impunity, but attack with the ability to avoid retaliation. It's this which truly changes some of the ideas and some of the preconcepts and some of the idea, the policies of a more balanced build which they had going into the war when the war began. When, when, when Pearl Harbor is hit in December 1941, the Americans go on a massive building uh, spree and a massive ordering spree. There's all sorts of things being ordered. Alaska class cruisers are being ramped up. Everything's being ramped up. By about halfway through 1942, there's been a subtle order of priority established. And this is one of the reasons why you get the Essex Swarm coming in. The Essex Swarm have got priority. If the raids of 1942 had not gone their way, if, let's say, the carrier groups had been attacked by Congos, they'd been caught out at night and attacked by Congos and cruisers or something like that had attacked them, you could have been looking at a very different U.S. Navy. And therefore, you'd probably be dealing with a very different post-war U.S. Navy. Because if you get into the mindset that the task forces like the British and to extent the Americans had experimented with in the interwar period and the British had actually instituted, if you consider Force H, etc. These are carrier, fast capital ship task forces. These are hybrid task forces. If you consider if something happens to these carrier raids, then the model that comes out of World War II could well be that what you operate with is for every carrier, you have a fast capital ship to act as its protector. Because if they get caught, if that task group gets caught out by a fast capital ship, they get wiped out. Now, That's not the way things went. But if you consider what happens to HMS Glorious, if you consider how the British are deploying their task forces, and if you then go into these raids and you think, well, they have heavy cruisers along with them to protect them, if those heavy cruisers, if they get hit by Congos, if Congos wipes out one of these big raids, one of these carry raids, you can see very much a pattern emerging and a genesis of evidence emerging that... <gasps> Okay, the capital ship has now transitioned from being the primary strike asset to being the primary force security asset. So we have to have a task group which is, you know, centered on a capital ship and a carrier, or multiple carriers and a couple of capital ships as their security. And it's very easy for that to come about. It's very easy for that narrative to take hold of it because what you'd have is basically maybe you'd have that strike happen and maybe you'd have another scenario where later in the war where some carriers get attacked maybe they are escort carriers and there's a capital ship nearby oh good lord the capital ship protects them we can think of various incidents where that happened in the wartime period both versus japan and other powers It's very easy to, for a history to provide a narrative if a few, a few events change that lead to a strategic concept and a solidarity. We have, because of these raids, because of their success, it is accepted that the carriers can do it. The carriers are able to do it, that they can grow carrier power. They still need some security, but the fact is they're not running into Japanese capital ships every five minutes. They're not facing that threat. 
Therefore, they can concentrate on doing the carrier swarm. If it had gone differently, if it had gone differently, we'd have a very, very different U.S. Navy produced during the war. We'd have a very different U.S. Navy post-war. We'd have a very different British Navy post-war. We'd have a very different naval approach. And who knows? We might have even had... The Soviet Union might have actually even built some battleships, and then that completely changes the whole mixture, if that happens. Welcome to history. It's not predetermined. There are so many dice rolls. I mean, it's a permanent D&D game. And for those who don't know, that's Dungeons & Dragons. And advertise my book because thanks to all your support, that's how we keep this channel going. So people who like, share, subscribe, all the buttons down there, or Kofi, patron, and being a member of the channel, all these things are how this channel keeps going because frankly, without it, you, it wouldn't be keep going. But this is how I keep my dream of being a professional historian alive. And by that, I mean a professional historian and an academic professional historian. Because, let's be honest, I don't do much university work at the moment. I'm working on that. And I mostly am teaching you, which I love. And working on this channel, which I love. But the book, the actual published book, that's a, that's a good sign. Uh, for potentially continuing on my university career, as long as it keeps selling. And that's, again, thanks to all of you. And there is actually... I'm doing myself out of some sales here because I'm actually doing a competition, which you will find a link to down below, where there are two of these up for up to, up to be one. And it's a really cool competition. It's a really cool discursive his, a, a competition. And I am so happy with already the feedback I've already had from people about it. There are so many people who are writing me variations of, I am learning so much by researching this, or... I'm having so much fun by thinking this through because we have to think it through logically. And um, it's cool. It's so cool. It is. It's a great way. Alternate history. Thinking about the where the route we didn't go is a great way to learn about the route we did go. Because if you look, as I was just discussing, you know, what happens if things had gone wrong, that alternate history, that's that's the Flick of a coin. That's literally the flip of a coin. It's, it's whichever side it falls. It's very easy to see the narrative going the other way. Especially with the earlier air groups. Because we all know the issues of the earlier air groups. I've discussed the Dauntless. Its issues with its Mark 13 torpedo, which then they shift the blame. Oh, we can't let the Mark 13 torpedo take the blame. We're going to blame the, the, the aircraft. Yes, because it's better to blame the aircraft. I suppose you're building, already building new aircraft than admit you mucked up with your torpedo procurement and testing. It's always so much better to do that. It's always so much more honest. So, the purpose of the raids. This is the important thing of starting off. Where do these raids begin? Well, let me start off with... They don't begin... With a president. They don't begin with Roosevelt. There are many things I have great respect for Roosevelt on. The way he treated Admiral Kimmel is never going to be one of them. And honestly, it sets a precedent for how a lot of things are treated in the early war period. Things are blamed to cover up for, 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 for major failings in other areas. The Dauntless is blamed to cover up for failings in the Mark 13 torpedo. Kimmel is blamed because Roosevelt's team and Roosevelt involved had got rid of Richardson, his predecessor, because using all the intelligence he was being given and the fact that he was an expert on the Japanese, he'd been saying, you are putting me in a death zone. Pearl Harbor is not a suitable base for me. You have not given me enough security. You've not given me enough air defense. We don't have enough fighters. We don't have enough... 
Def uh, enough radar. We uh, That's radar working. We don't have enough warning. Why do I not have enough fuel? Why do I not have enough oilers? Why can I not take the fleet to sea properly and exercise them properly and mobilize them properly? Why am I fleet having to sit in harbour? This is not a good place to be sitting in harbour. This is not a good harbour to be sat in. Why are we here? Why do we not, we not have the support facilities? Why do we not have the dockyards? Why do we not have anything? Basically, Richardson's messages were a long litany of complaints. And the thing is, Richardson, even more annoyingly, had the communication skills and the knowledge to back up those complaints and cause trouble. So had his predecessor, who had also been got rid of for similar reasons. So they suddenly noticed, what's the problem? Okay, we're putting Kimmel in. And what we're going to do to replace him is he's not going to get access to the same information the others got access to. He's not going to get the same distribution. And they don't give it to the army officer either. And, yeah. Kimmel gets the blame for Pearl Harbor. Kimmel didn't have the information at all of what's going on. Kimmel only has the very limited basic information being sent to him. He's not on the high security decrypt list that's supposed to be sent to him as the Commander-in-Chief of Pacific Forces. Well, pretty much of the Pacific Naval Forces, but pretty much everything if you consider the area he's covering. He's not getting any of the information he's... Neither is the army general in charge of base. And then people go, well, you know, they had their aircraft positioned like they were, they were expecting, you know, this sort of attack of saboteurs and their their ships were all in harbour. And so they go, well, even without that information, uh, Kimmel was still complaining he didn't have enough fuel. He was doing his best to keep as much of his fleet out to the sea as possible. And he got all his oilers keeping his carriers out at that time so he couldn't keep the battleships out. That's the entire reason the battleships are there. Because he doesn't have the oilers to get them out. Because Pearl Harbor doesn't have the infrastructure at this point. One of the reasons why the war takes so long to get going in the Pacific is because they have to build a whole load of infrastructure at Pearl Harbor. Because it hadn't been built. Because some bright president had decided this is going to be the ultimate statement of American power. We are going to advance... We are going to go forward into the Pacific with manifest destiny on our side, and we are going to show them that we are unafraid. But, I'm more importantly, Congress, I'm not going to ask you for one cent to pay for the necessary infrastructure to support that, because that would cause an entire spending battle, an entire all sorts of things to have to come up and be discussed in Congress, and I don't want to fight that political battle. So there they are. They are off in the Pacific. They're off in the way. Kimmel gets hit. Pearl Harbor happens. And he immediately starts planning the counterattacks. So immediately, carrier air aids? Where on? Which targets? Where should we be going? And we need to think about this sensibly. What can we actually do? What forces do we actually have available? What forces can we organize? What forces are we likely to face? And start planning them. And I know, Roosevelt comes in later and goes, We must hit Japan! What well, a very fact it takes months from him saying, We must hit Japan as soon as possible, to them actually launching a strike on Japan. Shows you the fact that Roosevelt had already lost that particular argument. Because when Nimitz comes in to take over after, uh, after Kimmel, and Nimitz had avoided the post before Kimmel. And remember, he turned down the post which Kimmel was given. Because he knew what information was coming and he didn't want the poison chalice that was the Commander-in-Chief Pacific Fleet. It was a poison chalice. It would have been ruining careers. Because every admiral who'd been in it, no matter how qualified, how great they'd been, and let's be honest, Richardson should have been the one in it. Because Richardson is the American Navy's expert on Japan. There is no one better informed. There is no one who has studied the Japanese in more detail. There is no one who understands them more. And please note, he's one of the people actually consulted on the targeting list after this. He's one of the key people who's advising them on how to structure these attacks. How to work with a maximum effect on the Japanese government's psychology. So he really is the person you should have out there. You know, this is the thing. Nimitz is a great organiser, and I will not distract anything from Nimitz. But he is not the Japan expert. You needed, you needed both of them out there. 
Um, it might have been sensible to have brought Richardson back as his deputy commander or something like that. I'm not sure. If Richardson is such enough of a patron, he'd probably have accepted that. Or maybe reverse the two, the, the two order around. Have one as um, in charge of operations and one in charge of the theatre. Theatre commander, operations commander. There are things you could have done to make it work. But they didn't. They didn't. And so, Kimmel's, with the support of his second-in-command, who basically willfully stabs him in the back, um, I have very little time for some of the American animals. Uh, I can understand why they make decisions they do, but I don't agree with it. And... Nimitz comes in, takes over from Kimmel, and goes, I like this idea where you're going, carry on. And when he's given the orders, he goes, don't worry, we're working on something. We're working on plans. But at no point did anyone go, right then, we've got our carriers already, already. let's load them up, let's go and attack Tokyo. Because you could have done that. Please, do not get me wrong. There is no reason you need to wait for B-25s to be ready to fly off and go for all the process of selecting B-25s to fly off a carrier to go and launch a carrier strike on Tokyo. You can do it without them. You can you can go and launch a strike. It might not be survivable. You're going to be that much closer. Let's be honest, the maximum strike range of the torpedo, uh, the, the torpedo aircraft, the Dauntless even in bomber configuration, is probably about 300, 350 nautical mi uh, 350 miles. Um, add in everything else, that's probably, you're probably aiming for getting closer to 300 miles range as your maximum strike range. And of course, that would have to be in daylight. That would have to be in daylight. But it's, 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 it's possible. It's, it's possible to do it. You could have done it. It would have also been completely giving in to the absolute plan of the Japanese, which the American Navy did understand. The American Navy expected Japan to bait them, to try and drag them in, and fight a battle with them. Uh, basically, they knew the Japanese had similar strategies to themselves, and similar understandings to themselves. They also knew the Japanese looked to Toshima. Toshima is Japan's Trafalgar. And Tashima had been one of the most decisive battles ever fought in history. Arguably, it's even more decisive than Trafalgar in terms of its total entire defeat of the, its opponent. And that had been carried out thanks to the Russians being baited into doing the most stupid thing they could do. A, sending as many ships as they could, including ships which had no, no justifiable value in being sent. And B, sending the, the sh all the ships they did have all the way around the world, without the, about the ability to support them. Honestly, for those ships to be viable, they'd need to spend, I don't know, six months sitting in Hong Kong, with all the British facilities there, merchant, uh, civilian and naval, supporting them, and had Russian star, uh, Russian equipment being uh, taken down to fix everything. It's just, there is no way they're going to be viable. And the Japanese idea, the uh, you know, we always talk about the Kantai Kesson. I've done videos about this on this channel because it's what everyone focuses on, the Japanese, the decisive battle. What they tend to forget is that decisive battle is supposed to take place after an entire period of attrition. Where the American fleet is supposed to come in and, regardless of casualties, keep on coming. Now... Even the Japanese did not think the Americans were so stupid they would do that if they were coming logically. If they were just coming as they declared war. They were trying to give them an emotional reason to do so. And Pearl Harbor is the target chosen. The trouble is, as I've often said, Pearl Harbor is too effective to enable that to happen. Because you don't have the viable battle line to be able to send it. You've done so much damage to the battle line as a whole. The Americans are not going to charge out battleships because they don't. They don't. They can't charge out battleships. Not immediately. They're going to. Every single ship in the bat in the fleet. It requires some measure, some level of repairs. 
So that means automatically they're going to have time to cool from the heat of anger to the, uh, the well, let's be honest, the ice of fury. Uh, when you go from the anger, the real red hot heat of anger, you go down to the ice of fury sort of thing. Well, you're doing that, and secondly, the the Americans were smart enough to realize that was the, probably the Japanese plan. The Americans, if you look at War Plan Orange, everything, they're always talking about a consolidated advance. And basically, that's code for no, we are not going to charge forward heedless of casualties and get ourselves bushwhacked. Because, again, the reason the Japanese wanted to inflict casualties on the Americans, wanted to trip them before they fought them, is so they'd be the same size as them. Or at least within striking range. Now. The thing is, the raids, what are they for about? If they're not about revenge, what are they about then? What are they for? Well, Pearl Harbor means the Japanese are setting the pace of the conflict. After this point, they are setting the pace of the conflict. By the time the raids are completed, the Americans have taken control of the pace of the conflict. They are setting its tone. The point about those uh, those raids is that they are to show the Japanese that the Americans can and will strike them. And that Japan has to defend itself. If you think about how many attacks the Japanese didn't manage, how many formations they didn't produce, how their forces are structured when they deploy. Imagine Midway or... Coral Sea if there had been far a far larger presence of the battle fleet. You might think, oh, well, yeah, that, that would mean those battleships would get sunk. It could do. It could mean that. Mark 13 torpedo is still a bit of an issue, so there is a, a goodly chance, no. I do realise how effective Mark 13 torpedo becomes by the end of the war. Please note, I do know that, and there will be many people commented, oh, it was far bigger than the British and all these things. It, it was. It was the biggest aerial drop torpedo. It was, it was wonderful when it worked. And that's not the torpedo's fault. Believe it or not, none of this, whenever people start going blaming the weapon systems, I go, it's, it's not their fault. It's the people who procured those weapon systems' fault. If you want to blame someone, you don't blame an inanimate machine which doesn't order itself to be created. You blame the people who create it. Just, just, that's the way it works. So, the reality is, if you'd had slightly more capital ships, maybe, and our forces deployed forward, more risk taken, well, what happens if the American aircraft, instead of attacking the Japanese carriers when they're reloading, have a nice fat battleship squadron to go after? And then the carrier, Japanese carriers launch. What happens then? History can change very quickly. But the thing is, that was never going to happen because... The moment you've carried out these raids, getting closer and closer to Japan, getting closer and closer to critical defensive and critical security infrastructure, let alone positions, not perimeter positions, but actual infrastructure logistical positions inside their perimeter, and attack Japan itself, well, you've done it, and Japan has to live with it. And suddenly, Japan's going to worry. Think about all the fighters, all the resources which never leave Japan during World War II. Think about all the tanks which never leave Japan during World War II. And yes, you can sit there and go, well, those wouldn't have helped that much. Wouldn't have helped this. Actually, some of those resources, you put them on some of those, uh, some of those islands, some of those things which are fought over... And whilst I don't think they change the outcome, they might well change the bill. They might well change the bill greatly. And that could have an effect on the war. It could certainly have an effect on the pace of the war.
So, what are their assets? Well, if you take away Navy's battle squadrons, what does it have in the late 1930s, early 1940s? It has its carriers. And let's be honest, these are some very, very pretty carriers. Now, you're probably going, Alex, why is Hornet not up here? Well, she only joins for the last raid, and she spends most of that raid being a rather large aircraft ferry. Because she can't launch a recover and think because she has a load of B-25s on her flight deck. So, she's not including us. In fact, for most of these operations, she's off trying to figure out how to launch army bomber aircraft from a carrier. That's mostly the work of Hornet. I know there are several Ameri uh, several American. Uh, um, <clears throat> I can't want to call them American Army Air Corps. Army Air um, Army Air Corps um, pilots involved in that, and they do a great job. But let's be honest, Hornet is the star of the show, and I'm not saying that just because I'm a naval historian and I like ships. I'm saying it because I like ships. She's a star. So, Enterprise, Lexington, and Yorktown are off doing the raiding. Sometimes they're solo, sometimes they're in pairs. Really, if they turn up as a group, that's when you're really in trouble. And again, this is the point about the whole Tokyo raid. If you consider the beginning of this period, you have also Saratoga available before she's damaged. You could have quite easily organized a free four carrier operation to attack Tokyo. If you wanted, you could even go further. You could, you know, and I can't believe I'm saying this, you could get the two interesting carriers of the US Navy. And by that, I, of course, mean Ranger and Wasp. Added them onto the group and taken them out with Saratoga, Lexington, Enterprise, Yorktown, Hornet, and gone for a full six carrier strike on Tokyo. You could have done that. Would have required pretty much every oiler you had available. It would have been tenuously supported at best by heavy cruisers and light cruisers, uh, heavy cruisers, light cruisers and destroyers. With, let's be honest, the destroyers probably ending up hanging back with the oilers as they did historically on the Doolittle raid. Because, again, fuel issues. You could have done all that and launched a strike. You could have done all of that. And honestly, between all those six carriers and their air groups, you would have had a very capable force to launch such, a, such an attack. But you would have had to get far closer to Japan. Honestly, the Japanese were waiting for it and hoping for it at that point, so you'd actually have to run into far more preparations. Because the Japanese preparations hadn't been continuing on for a few months, and the longer it goes on, the more quickly these things dec decrease in capability. And... You would also, and this is probably more important... With the aircraft you had available immediately, if you launched a strike, let's say, in January 1942, as your opening strike, the aircraft, the air crews you have, who haven't had the experience of all these carrier raids, all these operations to grow experience, these are not the air crews of Coral Sea and Midway. These are not those air crews. These are very good air crews. They are full of... Vim and Vigor, they are full of enthusiasm. But they are not, and I mean this with great respect, they are not the skilled veterans they will become. They are not seasoned. You've not tested their forces in, uh, tested their metal in conflict. And you would be asking from them a maximum operation. Because of the difference in the distances we're talking about. Between the strike range of the B-25s launching from the carriers. The modified, heavily modified B-25s launching from the carriers. And the carrier aircraft they could have launched. 
Under those circumstances, I cannot see you not losing aircraft. And not losing... Certainly you'd lost aircraft. I think you'd have also lost carriers. I think you'd lost ships. Full stop. And as it is, if you look at the carrier raids... They're incredibly successful. Incredibly successful. Mostly because of these ships, let's be honest. The Yorktown class, Lexington class, the difference in them really shows a difference in American engineering and, in, and ship power and power plant management. And the fact that the Yorktowns could do quite such long range. And when I say long range, I mean, let's think about this. They could do... 12,500 nautical miles at 15 knots. That's good. That's really good. I mean, 12,500 nautical miles at 15 knots is very, very good. Top speed, 32.5 knots. Lesson class, well, they had a top speed of 34.5 knots. By World War Two, it's usually this. It is roughly 33 and a quarter knots. But again, sometimes they're pushed a bit. So you've got roughly a two knot speed advantage. And you also do have a 10,000 nautical mile range at 10 knots. So the thing is, their turbo electric transmissions and the way their engines are set up gives them a higher speed overall, but gives them a lot less endurance and range. They require a lot more oiling. Still, these are good ships, good carriers, and the US Navy gives them good officers to command them. Now, I'm going to start off with Wilson Brown, because for some reason, I think the slide, the slide definitely said William Brown, and I'm hoping I didn't actually call him William Brown in the live. It's Wilson Brown. It's William Halsey and Frank Fletcher. And literally it goes Brown, Fletcher, Halsey in the pictures. Most of you, if you're watching this channel, are probably how familiar with Halsey. Some of you will be familiar with Fletcher. I'm not sure how many will be familiar with Brown. This man is amazing for many reasons, and I'll be getting into them. This man is who would probably be leaving, leading the strikes if Kimmel is left in charge. Not just Coral Sea and the Battle of Midway, but would actually be leading strikes and doing our things uh, in sort of the, a lot of these campaigns. And this is the man who really does take over. But the interesting thing is, if Brown's career had panned out differently, if he hadn't gotten ill, and I'll discuss the point in this point, he's actually senior to both of them. He's the senior officer. And if he had been able to stay in the area's operating task forces, then he would most likely have been one of the fleet commanders. And there is a very real possibility that it is Brown and, Fl uh, Brown and Fletcher who end up heading up task forces and operations rather than Halsey and Fletcher. And that would be a very big change to history. Why is Wilson Brown so interesting? Well, that's to consider. His career included serving with four presidents. Actually serving in the White House. He was as pretty much a political career as anyone could have. He'd also been Chief of Staff of Naval War College and Superintendent of the U.S. Naval Academy. He was made a Rear Admiral in 1936, and for those who don't know, at this time in the U.S. Navy, that's the highest rank you could actually achieve. Please note, when I say it's highest rank you could actually achieve, it's your highest permanent rank. Everything other than that is a temporary promotion, which means if they want to dismiss you, they just take your promotion away. They don't need to argue with it. They, there's no there's no need for a court martial or anything like that because you're only given a temporary promotion. You're not you don't actually have that rank. You have a 
billet, which is a higher rank. And you get to act in that rank as long as you're in that billet. You lose the billet, you lose the rank. It's basically been something that the Americans had to deal with for quite a long time. Was some very strange attitudes towards having senior officers. And arguably this has caused them both advantages in that they can pick from any rear admiral, theoretically to promote them, to whatever rank they want. They can have they can pick as the moment you've got a rear admiral, you're eligible for any job in theory up to the top job because you're all rear admirals. Yes, some might have more experience, yes, some might have served in other posts, but theoretically you can pick them all. But in reality one of the reasons why you have a promotional system still going in peacetime where you have vice admirals, full admirals, admirals of the fleet or whatever you, you sort of you want to talk about, talk about it. The one of the reasons you have those going on, have that system going on, is that it also limits down the amount of political playing that can go on with your rank structure. The amount of politics that can be played. Because the Navy can basically go, well, yeah, these are the rear admirals, we've promoted to vice admiral. These are the vice admirals, we've promoted to full admiral. This posting is an admiral's posting. Select from the admirals. At worst, you can go and select from the vice admirals. It's a way of ensuring, or rather limiting, perhaps political influence, especially if we think about it in major appointments in wartime, because often politicians are more, far more interested in who gets promoted to what rank in wartime than they are in peacetime. In peacetime, most armed forces at best get ignored, at worst actively crippled. Uh, by their own governments, due to various things. In wartime, those governments suddenly take a tremendously obsessive interest in a leadership and how it affects them. If you've limited down their ability to pick certain pe uh, people, means they might have managed to get a guy, uh, get someone. Let's say in this period it would be a guy, but you know, get someone to rear admiral by political endeavour. However, it's very easy to make sure that they don't get the postings they need to, to qualify for a vice admiral. I'm sorry, you're. I'm sorry, it just hasn't worked out the way we we cannot promote you. And as you're now out of zone, um, we have a lovely posting for you. Please go and be superintendent of a dockyard, in the Bahamas. Or there are all sorts of options for us to send you off to. Fly your flag ashore. Fly your flag high ashore, a long way away from the fleet. Go and become Governor General. Go and become... There's options, basically. The British, British are really, really good at this by this point. Um, they, they, had, they realized they'd had a bit of a failing with it in the 1900s and 1910s. They, and to extent the beginning of World War One. By World War Two, they were... They had developed it to a dark art. The actual manipulation to make sure any officer who was too politically connected in a bad way, i.e. they used their political... They, they served their political friends in the Navy rather than serving the Navy in their interactions with their political friends. They were manoeuvred. And there are officers like Henderson, who was the third Sea Lord from 1953 to 1959 when he dies, Who's pretty much at the exact antithesis of that? Who's able to do his political, manages political friendships and uh, relationships to better serve the navy? He's third sea lord. The navy has managed to work out what the difference is and who's going to get promoted to what. The Americans have an issue at this point. Wilson Doe was still pretty darn good. I would say he is closer to the Henderson model than other admirals who I won't name. I'm going to be doing a year of leadership at some point. I think that's going to be next year's videos, next year's themes, and honestly, that's going to go into a lot of officers' careers and talk about exactly what they did. As much as we know. Remember, a lot is never written down. 
Now, Brown, unlike a lot of other admirals in this period, had not managed to get trained as an aviator. He was commander scouting for Pacific Fleet with the rank of Vice Admiral and being made that on the 1st of February 1941. In 1938, he'd been, the, from 1938 onwards, he'd been the superintendent of the U.S. Naval Academy. So, 1st of February 1941, he's brought over to these operations. He is Commander Scouting Force Pacific Fleet, with the rank of Vice Admiral. Scouting Force, let's be honest, the carriers were part of the Scouting Force. The carriers are taken over from the battle cruisers. The Lexington class battle cruisers, which are being planned to be the core of the scouting group, had suddenly become the Lexington class carriers. So he's not an aviator, but he's sort of in charge of aviation assets. Sort of. There are all sorts of things going on and other sort of rank structures as well in place. So please note it's it's a whole video in itself going into the Pacific Command's rank structure. Again, year of the leadership probably will go into a lot of command structures involved and the various officers. And how they will come about those command structures. It could be interesting. Anyway, he was put in charge of Task Force 11, which is centred aboard, centred on the USS Lexington and from the USS Lexington. And he takes part in some raids. The raid, the major raid he takes part in, isn't successful and I'll be getting into what happens because of course sadly enough that ends up into a bit of a battle just a bit of a battle and that's not good that's not good for him that's not good for anyone really but he's involved And his deteriorating health leads him to be... Well, Nimitz, basically, uh, wants to try and get rid of him. Um, but King intercedes. Ernest King, the Admiral who hates anything that reeks of politics. And he's got this Admiral who is both a bit of an Anglophone, he likes the British, and absolutely does almost non-stop political appointments. He's trying to support, trying to keep him in post. He's, he, he's trying to keep him in post. And he's then appointed the Amphibious Forces Commander Pacific, and then he's sent back further to the 1st Naval District, and then in February 1943, he's sent to be Naval Aide to President Roosevelt. And he'll carry on serving as Truman's Naval Aide, uh, Naval Aide as well. He writes a book, post-war, about four presidents as I saw them. I'm told it's a really good read. I haven't managed to ever get an actual copy. I have hunted for a copy. I have never managed to get one. He managed to make such an impression on the presidents that even Eleanor Roosevelt writes that she was saddened to read in the paper of Vice Admiral Wilson Brown's death. He was my husband with my husband for a long time. My husband was very fond of him. He retired in 1945, and I lived in Waterford, Connecticut, where I had the pleasure of visiting Mr. Brown and the Admiral Sam Wilson uh, some years ago. He certainly had an active and interesting career and was highly valued by everyone with whom he served. It must be a consolation when the evening of life draws near to look back on so many accomplishments, and I know Admiral Brown enjoyed his, ta his home in Waterford and was a valued member of his community. He reserved a love of family and friends and in respect and admiration of those who, with whom we, uh, one has worked, is to end a life of service in this world with flags flying and a sense of a complete life. Now, yes, there is certainly a level of it's expected when someone who's been an important aide in the porn period dies that people are going to write words of condolence. But that's rather a lot of words and rather a personalised set of words for someone who was just for a pro forma message. For a pro forma document, that's uh, that's interesting. That's not pro forma, basically.
he had been given a Navy Cross for the service of as commanding officer of USS Parker, which of course was an Alwyn class destroyer in World War One. He had received a Navy Distinguished Medal for his services in February and March 1942. He is an officer who has a tremendous impact on the shape of the war and the shape of the world, mostly through his advice and working with the political end of the spectrum rather than the naval end of the spectrum. And it is sad that his illness forced him home because I think he could have been a very senior officer in the Pacific War and a very useful voice for the US Navy post-war if he had had such. But someone who is that able to communicate with the political class but with, let's say, Bray closer to Halsey on him. Well, that's a useful weapon in the funding battles. Then we have Fletcher. Fletcher is... Fletcher was Commander Cruiser Division 6, and he was at sea when Pearl Harbor was attacked. First thing, pretty much, Kim, uh, Kimmel does is put Fletcher on his short list of potential successors, if necessary, and Kimmel also put him in command of the Wakeheim Relief Task Force, which was planned to go, and he was also picked out as first choice by Kimmel for any task forces that he need to send. Fletcher is considered an absolutely prime capability naval officer. And he would command Task Force 17 built around the Yorktown. He's again another surface fleet officer. He learned air operations like Wilson did on the job. When people say he's taught what to do by Halsey or others, you can say that. He's the most junior, probably, of the three in the role. But he's also one of the ones with the most innate talent, I would argue. Fletcher is, to my mind, in terms of... If I was looking at a figure to compare him to from a British perspective, I know if you're American, you're pr you, you probably have enough history, US Navy, to understand Fletcher himself. But if you're British, in, Fletcher is slightly less well known, despite his big successes at Dan Halsey. He's just not as big a personality on the stage. I'd say you're looking at a Somerville type character in Fletcher. In fact, those are admirals who I would certainly put together. When I talk about Halsey, I'm going to link him to another British Admiral and say these are sort of their similarities, but I would say you're looking at a Somerville in terms of Fletcher. In Brown, he's not got the engineering and design background or literally the scope to be a Henderson in terms of being able to advance and corral the politicians and get the ships built. It would have been really interesting to see if he could have been in charge of the Bureau of Ships or Bureau of something, what uh, what he would have got accomplished with his skills, but his skills he was always focused on the top job, and it's a really interesting role he plays there. So it's sort of different, it's difficult to really compare him. And finally, we have Halsey. Halsey is... Well, I would love to say he's one of a kind, but really him and another admiral, to my mind, in World War II, typify everything. In that Halsey decides that, frankly, he's being in command of an aircraft carrier. Um, he needs to learn how to fly. And... He's offered the observer program, and he goes, no, I'll do the pilot program. 
at the age of 52, he gets his Naval Aviator Wings in 1935. So, at the age of 52, seven years before the events of this. So, 1942, he is 59. He gets his aviator wings. He gets them. He's promoted to Vice Admiral in 1940. By this time, he has been incredibly involved in... Developing a naval aviation. He has been for the previous five years in 1940, he has been indelibly involved in the development of naval aviation and doctrine. He is fundamentally a very aggressive, very pugnacious, very persistent naval officer. If you want an equivalent, you're probably from Britain, you're probably talking about Admiral Philip Vian, who starts. World War Two is a lot younger than Halsey, and starts World War Two as a tribal destroyer flotilla commander, with the rank of captain. He ends World War Two as a vice admiral. He ends World War Two as a vice admiral. Um, fairly decent rate of promotion. With Halsey. He's actually one of the people who's called to testify in husband Kim, Admiral Kimmel's hearings, in the hearing about him, and he sums up American carrier tactics as being basically the alpha strike. Get the other fellow everything you have as fast as you can and to dump it on. Basically, hit first, hit hardest, and make sure they don't hit you back. And he never he decided he'd never have hesitated to use a carrier as an offensive weapon. He also also was quite famously um there are various issues with some of the testimonies that go into the various hearings, and quite a few senior officers, including those like Halsey, found it really annoying. I'm using annoying to substitute for another word which would probably involve a lot of swearing before it. What exactly happened and how it was run? Okay, How it was shaped. How things took place. They didn't like it. They didn't like it at all. They felt that was a very political operation. Anyway, those are your task force commanders. Let's look at the rest of your task forces. So, the task forces, yes, they are based around their carriers. But a task force is not just a carrier. And as I started discussing at the beginning, the Americans knew they were running into issues deploying these ships forward. They were not going to be supported. These groups were not going to be supported. There was going to be no capital ships. The Americans do not have fast capital ships. They don't at this point. Okay? The Iowas are coming. Uh, the South Dakotas, they are not in service yet. They are, well, actually, no. One, I tell a lie. One of them is in service during these, uh, this period. I mean, literally, it's South Dakota herself. She is commissioned in March 1942. And Indiana is commissioned in April 1942, but that's the 30th of April when all the operations are over. So, literally, South Dakota is the sole example around. And her top speed is 27.5 knots. So, not really what you want. Honestly, there is a strong chance in my mind, especially for the Doolittle raid, if you'd had one of the Iowas available... Uh, Top speed, 33, 35, potentially 0.2 knots if they're on a light low, but usually 33 knots. Able to do roughly 14,900 nautical miles at 15 knots. Yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised if the Doolittle Raid had actually received an Iowa-class escort. I, I That would make sense to me. If you're, do, if you're throwing that level of force through that level of risk, if you had got an Iowa, Iowa herself along with you, then, well, good luck any 
any Congo or anything which joins up. You know, it would be it would be a short, sharp, and painful fight, but it wouldn't be about uh, the eye would be going. Hello, you arrived. But the Americans don't have anything. Uh, there is an actual discussion when Victorious is going over to play USS Robin and do that job, whether the British need to send a capital ship with her for escort, because that's the British doctrine. But of course, the British, the particular section of the government which is asking that question for the British of the Royal Navy, then gets to point out, of, well, you remember how you took two of our fast capital ships and without carrier, so a, ca a carrier available, you forward deployed them to Singapore to try and act as a deterrence to the... Uh, to the uh, to the Japanese and it failed because they didn't have the required air support with them. Yeah. Well, of our truly fast capital ships, i.e., ones which could do fast than thirty knots, we only have one vessel remaining called HMS Renown. No, we need it. We don't know what we need it for, but we need it. So Renown didn't get to go with Victorious. <sighs> They'd already lost us, also lost Hood as well. But you know, that that's the problem. E another problem for capital ships, really, when you're looking at them, the sort of post World War Two, is that keeping up with carriers, especially carriers are moving very fast by this point, and out. They move fast, allow air, air to go over the decks to allow them to watch heavier aircraft, but also they move fast as a form of strategic mobility. They are in many ways, have taken over the battle cruiser role of strategic mobility. You need to be a very fast capital ship for it. And a number of those in the world which are actually truly fast and truly capable, very, very few. Very, very few. Um, you know, the Royal Navy had HMS Vanguard hanging around for many years, but her top speed is 30 knots. The King George V class had been 28 knots. The Lion class had been planned to be 30 knots as well. 30 knots sort of does. 33 knots, better. 35 knots, very good, thank you very much. But you need, you need speed. Renown, Pulse, Hood, had had that speed, and the British had practiced with it. The Americans, though, they have another problem in their list of their heavy cruisers. It's the fact that I've done an entire video series on the American heavy cruiser and cruiser production in the interwar years. And one of the things I kept going back to is that quite a lot of the earlier, older American heavy cruisers were actually scout cruisers. They had 8-inch guns, but they were built to scout cruiser roles. So they were built fast, long-legged... All those things you want. All the things you want for a scout cruiser profile. They don't exactly have a lot of armour. Now, admittedly, even in a fight, in a fight versus a Congo, armour wouldn't help them that much. But, um... It'd be nice to have something. Something to help them deal with the blast damage. Even if of an indirect hit. Or a near miss, let alone... Uh, so, you know, to, so they can deal with that. They don't. And... The designs do get better as time goes on. They do. And I am summarising a whole long series of videos. So before you react to that and write a whole impassioned, massive comment down below in defence of American cruisers, please go look at the whole series of videos. And then write the impassioned comment about uh, about how you disagree with me. But it's always more fun to have it on the actual vi those actual videos. The cruiser videos... For some reason, out of all my videos, they don't get another. They don't get a lot of later on viewership. I'm not sure why. I like those videos. The other thing the Americans have is their destroyers. Of course, their destroyers are very good. They're very nice destroyers. But again, there's a problem going on. Can they keep up the high speed all the time along the way? And honestly, the real advantage the Americans have are the light cruisers. But they don't have enough of them. They notice a theme here. One of the things that often comes up is the Second London Naval Treaty. And the fact that, does it have cumulative tonnage limitations? 
Not in the text of the treaty. Not in the text of the treaty. So theoretically, you can you can avoid that. However, it did have it in the original versions of it. And the original version of it, when they were trying to get Japan in there. When Japan's not in it, they'll get out of it. But then they all still are thinking, both Britain and America, are thinking that, well, A, America's thinking Japan will never declare war on us. They wouldn't dare. It was far too big, far too powerful. But B, they are, they are sort of slowballing it and building up slowly. And they think they have time. Everyone thinks they have time. So one of the things why I find currently you have a lot of people going around predicting we have 12 months or 18 months till war, and I'm going probably not. Because usually war happens when people are sure it's going to be a long way off. Um, wars tend to... Uh, when people think a war's going to happen in a year's time, etc., and they're talking about it, um, it's less likely. But also... I tend to find it great because the moment you say wars a year going to happen a year's time, suddenly all sorts of things get taken off the expense table of what you're procuring. After all, that takes two years to build, three years to build. Why do you want to get that? Or you've got to wait that long for those aircraft to come off that production line, so you you shouldn't get those. You should buy this, which no one else is buying at the moment. Why is no one else buying it? Is it because it's not as good as everything as the other stuff? Is it because it's not as useful, so no one wants it? And all the stuff which people do want is back-ordered. Yeah, but we need it now. We need something available now because it's a year, it was a year away. Why? Always be very careful of doomsayers who say they can predict the future. Or people, prophets who are predicting great futures who can predict the future. No one really can. And on the subject of current, of wars, well, we're in, talking about World War II here. Let's be honest, the person who could probably most likely have put together the information and worked out what was happening is a guy called Admiral Richardson who had been re removed by Roosevelt and removed from getting the information by Roosevelt. So, uh, because he kept saying, war's coming and you've got me in a position which is not prepared. Please, either let me move the fleet back to San Francisco or let me prepare this position and give me the funding and the necessary equipment to do so. History doesn't tend to repeat. It does rhyme. And when we've got nothing like that going on. When you start seeing admirals, generals, being dismissed or moved away because they are talking far too much about problems and talking about real problems in the armed forces, that's when you worry about conflict within a year. Until that starts happening... It's mostly politics, especially about funding. And speaking of that, the Americans really did need funding because they had good cruiser designs, they had good destroyer designs, everything coming in. But that's not what they had available to fight in 1941-42. They had what they had built in the 20s and 30s available to fight. And that has been built largely with a Congress whose idea of spending money on defense is let's have a jolly good party which we're going to spend as much as we can of when we launch the thing we've just spent the bare minimum on. And that's me being charitable. So he's, here are all the rates. Here are all the rates. Gilbert Islands, 1st of February 1942. Rabul, 20th of February 1942. Wake, 24th of February 1942. Marcus, 4th of March, 1942. Uh, Sa uh, Salamanca and Lau, Lay, uh, 10th of March, 1942. And, of course, the Doolittle Raid, OK, Japanese Archipelago, 18th of April, 1942. Those are the raids. Mostly single carrier operations right up until you get to the end. 
hence a multi-carrier force. It's a multi-carrier force. So, I'm going to quickly apologize because, well, had a bit of fun. Had a bit of fun with this video. I um, decided it was going to go out on the following Saturday because, honestly, there were computer issues. So, apologies for the interruption. Uh, those computer issues were, well, it turns out I'd managed to fill up my hard drive. And um, the one difference between OBS and uh, XSplit is XSplit used to tell, give me warnings. OBS only gives me warnings if I install the thing, which gives me warnings. I hadn't realized this. Dang. And I should have been checking it anyway. So, yeah, I've had to not only offload all the stuff onto my portable hard drive, which I just want to cover. I've filled up my portable hard drive. So now I'm going through a 4 terabyte portable hard drive. Um, about every two and a half months in data, I'm saying. It. This is because I do too many, too many draft recordings. And sorting everything out, etc. meant it went on a few days. And then I recorded it. And didn't like the version I recorded. And this is going out tomorrow, of course, on the 10th of February. So, because it's going to be my new policy that the Thursday video goes live as a long patrol on the, not next Saturday, but the following Saturday. Just to give me a bit more time to get things and deal with tech issues. So, yes, I have changed shirts. I'm now in my King's Creators Legends shirt, which I'll be wearing when I do my Tillman Live video of what Tillman does on the Washington Naval Treaty. So, um, hope you enjoyed yesterday's video, and on with this video. So let's consider these raids. Let's consider their planning. Now, earlier in this video, I have talked about a certain admiral. Not, not Kimmel, husband E. Kimmel, who'd started off by planning the raids straight after Pearl Harbor. No, no, no. I'm talking about James O. Richardson, the absolute expert on the Japanese the fleet commander until 1941 when he was dismissed because, well, he was starting to embarrass the government by telling them they were being stupid. He had spent his life studying the Japanese. He was not just the... And, and that's why I can quote from several different authors on this who basically say roughly the same thing. And this is according to the US Navy at the time itself. He was the Navy's, the US Navy's outstanding authority on the Pacific Naval Warfare and Japanese strategy and Japan as a whole. Yes, Admiral James O. Richardson, that well known officer who's used so well in the Pacific War by the Americans. Oh no, he's not! Oh no, he made the job of uh, the joy of actually embarrassing the politicians by pointing out they were being stupid. So he's not allowed to be involved. Um, he had a strong belief that the fleet should never have been berthed inside Pearl Harbor because it wasn't secure enough, it wasn't set up for the fleet long term. None of the things were there that should have been there for a major fleet base if you're going to move the fleet forward there. Um, for 10 years prior to the attack on Pearl Harbor, the US Navy had held attacks on the Army defenses at Pearl Harbor and had always been successful. Every single attack over 10 years had been successful. So yeah, pointing that sort of stuff out is a good way to not get promoted. In fact, to lose your position. But he is still on call and King is not an idiot. King is Admiral King, the Commander-in-Chief of the US Navy. The, you know, their equivalent of the first sea lord at the time, really. Chief Operations. Goes, Richardson, what do I do to attack them? How do I hurt them? He gives his advice. He gives his advice to Kimmel. He gives his advice to... Nimitz. He gives advice wherever he's asked, because he's a patriot. Because he is a solid U.S. Navy officer. And a lot of the people who are going to be fighting this war are people he's trained. So he tells them. If you want to torch them, you start off by showing them they're vulnerable. You take the pace and control of the timbre of war back off them by forcing them 
to become defensive. Remember, the Japanese strategy was basically risking it all in a dramatic attack. Not quite. You have to remember that the Pearl Harbor idea had been to do enough damage that the the Americans then would come out and, disregarding all losses, would charge at Japan and would get slowly worn down, but because they're so angry, they wouldn't take notice of their losses, and they keep coming and keep coming and keep coming, and eventually they'd be about the right size that the Japanese fleet could come out in all its strength and glory and smash them. You might be thinking that that plan requires A, several levels, and B, requires your opponent to be stupid. It does. But it also requires a very careful calibration on your own attack. As I've ta talked before about the attack on Pearl Harbor, it's too successful to cause the Americans to come charging out. It is more than successful enough, or rather successful enough, then it makes them angry. It makes them angry, but robs them of the ability of getting immediate revenge. And more importantly, it robs the politicians of the abilities to overrule the Navy to go charging out and get that immediate revenge. It's brilliant. The Navy know. They've been wargaming this the whole time. They know what the Japanese plan is because it's the only thing which makes sense. It's the only thing which, makes, which works to carry out a, a sort of attrition attacks and almost a naval guerrilla warfare to whittle away at the American strength until a big decisive battle where the forces are in near parity. In which case things like Yamoto and Mushashi suddenly become very, very relevant if that can work if you can work out that way. But the thing is, whilst navies work that out, politicians do want to demand immediate response. Remember, Kimmel had been planning an attack, he's dismissed the planning an attack, he was planning a, a raid, and then Roosevelt's demanding an immediate response, and that immediate response is not delivered till February 1942. And in fact, realistically, you could argue it's not delivered till the 18th of April 1942. And, as I've said before, they could have been sent earlier. They could have been... You, you could have... It would have been friggin' difficult to do, but it could have been done. You could have massed all your tankers, all your cruisers, all your carriers into one group and sent them out earlier. It's not really the sensible thing to do, but you could have done it. But the thing is, the Japanese had done just that much enough, that much enough damage that whilst everyone was still focusing on a battleship because the carriers hadn't won their laurels yet, they didn't have to. And these operations served as not just a way of taking back control of the pace of conflict from the Japanese, but also as a way for the American carrier forces to grow their experience and their training and their understanding of warfare and their actual operating capabilities. Now, the Marshall Gilbert raids, they're interesting. They are interesting. They are, of course, technically two raids. You have Task Force 8 and Task Force 17. William Halsey and Frank Fletcher in charge, Enterprise in Yorktown. Those wonderful two Yorktown carriers off to do their job. And this is primarily what the Yorktowns are for. Let's be honest, they are gorgeous carriers for this kind of operation. They really are. If there is any carrier which the Royal Navy actually covets of the US Navy. It's the Yorktowns. It sort of fits their profile for what they wanted for their strike carrier idea. Not quite, but it does, and it's got this gorgeous long range capability in operating sp spoken high speed you know, high speed operations. And honestly, when you start to look at how the Royal Navy freed from treaties is developing its carriers you can almost see them looking at it going down a similar route, which is very, very Yorktown. I wouldn't say it's Yorktown inspired, because the Royal Navy know what they want, and so, yeah, the, York, the fact that Yorktown is similar to it doesn't mean they're copying the Yorktown, it just means that they've got a... that's what they wanted and would have liked from the beginning. But it's always the interesting thing, is trying to sort of go, right, where is this carrier coming from? Quite a lot of people want to see the Essexes, they want to see 
all these sort of things, but actually, for the Royal Navy, the Yorktowns are far more closer to their ideal carry. If you could take a Yorktown and give it armor, and probably an enclosed hangar, because let's be honest, the North Sea, and the North Atlantic, and the South Atlantic all have a habit of trying to nick Royal Navy aircraft. Um, the Royal Navy feels those uh, those particular oceans are particularly out to get them, uh, particularly. That it would have been a it would have been far closer to Yorktown than pretty much any other of the American designs, and that's because they are perfect for this mission, this independent raiding mission. This is straight out of Royal Navy Task Force operations. This is straight out of American Task Force operations. The only nation which really doesn't have this kind of individual task force carrier operation going is the Japanese. Now, the differences between them all are the Japanese have the Congos, but they like to think of in terms of their kind of battle strategy as being very Pacific war focused and very much focused on the Americans, where they're thinking of a decisive attack. The Americans are thinking about dispersing to try and disperse Japanese forces, etc. So they're thinking of a raiding strategy. British are thinking, of course, an anti-surface raider, a sort of global reach presence strategy. And then you have the differences is that the Japanese have fast capital ships, but concentrate them with the force to Congos. The Americans don't have fast capital ships, so are always looking at a carrier cruiser task force. And the British are going, well, uh, we have Renown, Repulse, and Hood. <laughs> Fast carriers, fast ca very fast capital ships. Yes, they're battle cruisers, but combine those two things together, you get what Force H is in World War Two. So, this is some really interesting strategy in terms of how it shows how the different forces are reacting. And one of the things I would say throughout this strategy, I'm almost surprised if the British had had more of their um, capital ships, fast capital ships remaining. I if Hood and Repulse had not been lost. I think if Hood had been, let's say, sent to uh, survive and sent to repair in America, I could well see an earlier USS Robin scenario happening with the Americans going, do you mind if we borrow her to escort the strikes? Because their nightmare scenario for all this was Congos being involved. And that's actually where Richardson's coming in, because Richardson is in many ways explaining to them where he thinks the Congos are going to be. And he seems to be fairly correct in his approach. And again, we're getting a lot of this from... It's, it's still sort of sealed tangential sources. So we have this idea that Richardson is really is the one using his knowledge, his understanding of Japan to synthesize a lot of the data... And is certainly being called upon at this point. There are lots of very good intelligence specialists focusing in on it as well to structure these operations. But Richardson is really a resource for the senior officers because they've seen what's happened to his career. They know what happens if you make a mistake or if you are unlucky in the case of Kimmel. Or if you manage to upset the politicians by not doing what they want in the case of Richardson. So... They don't want to do those. They want to run this war. Now, Task Force 17 under Fletcher, centered on Yorktown, managed to inflict what can be usually described as moderate damage on Japanese naval installations on the islands of Jalut, Mili, and Makin, which are Buturi islands. Uh, and then Enterprise struck Kojian, Bocha, and Taroa. Now, um, Batari Islands, of course, Monday for the Gilbert Islands. I think that's what I, I think. I'm probably mispronouncing it terrible, uh, terribly. So please forgive that, please. And Guajin, Watcher, and Tara are the Marshall Islands. Now, during the attack, Enterprise is set on fire by a near miss. Um, and Chester, USS Chester, which is a heavy cruiser, it's always fun to take a heavy cruiser, a Northampton class heavy cruiser with you. I know. On this channel, I have talked about them a lot and said did a whole video about them. Where I went, well, really, they're not heavy cruisers. Really, they're scout cruisers. They are. The Americans were building scout cruisers, not heavy cruisers, because they were trying to fill in for the information loss of losing their Lexington class, which was supposed to be their great big information gatherers. 
and their ability to go around the world, uh, go around, beat up cruisers, and get out of there. That was what the Lexington class battle cruisers have been about. With only two Lexington class aircraft carriers, they can't really represent, uh, can't really replicate the role of six Lexington class battle cruisers in that function. They can in area coverage. But in terms of availability, two ships does not equal the same availability as six. It just doesn't. With six ships, you can guarantee two available at all times, and usually three. And honestly, with six, you can usually say, well, at least two of those are going to be at sea available, and one's going to be in harbour available to go out. And that's, e uh, that's even under the normal peacetime mechanisms. When you're down to two, it's which is available, which has got not got a maintenance issue, which has not got this, that, the other. As Britain's currently finding out, with only having two Queen Elizabeth class. Oh frigate! One of them has got uh, has got an issue with one of her propellers. Oh great! It's not exactly unnormal or unusual, but it means suddenly it's a national embarrassment because this other carrier is the other carrier is having to stand in for this carrier. Also, we only have one decent dock which can is fully certified to maintain them and we're trying to pretend we just have one. We have others which could theoretically accommodate them but we're desperately trying not to use them because that would admit we've uh, the government have made a mistake. This These videos are getting gradually more and more cynical when it comes to defence. I do apologise in current defence. I do apologise. It just squeaks over me sometimes when I look at the numbers in World War Two and the, the stuff and the the actual sensible infrastructure and logistics planning that was going on, and I think whole historian's job is to try and teach people to le uh, teach people what lessons were learned in the past. Somehow we've really failed with this current and at least the last two or three generations of politicians, and so many of them apparently had history degrees. It's just the antithesis of what I so everything I believe we should do as historians. But sorry. Anyway, the big thing about these attacks, they're great for American public morale. Yeah, that's brilliant. But psychologically, they're quite a big problem for the Japanese. They show that their prone to defense concept doesn't really work because, well, the islands are too far apart and too widely dispersed to actually be able to support each other. And basically, this serves to convince Yamoto, Yamamoto Isoroku Yamato, the uh, commander of the combined fleet, that he needed to draw the Americans into a major battle as soon as possible. And his plan, of course, famously results in Midway, which has a whole series of other miscalculations in it. But those are not today's topic. Now, the attack on Rabul didn't actually get to take place because Admiral Wilson Brown's task force actually managed to get discovered. Yeah, Japanese patrol aircraft managed to actually spot them. And when they spotted them, they decided to attack them. And when they're attacking them, that means they can't go and really attack them. They've lost the element of surprise. And let's be honest, there are enough forces in Rabol and around Rabol that if he charges in without the element of surprise, he could have get, got trapped, or worse, bushwhacked. And the reason he's a very bushwhacked is, of course, he was actually supposed to have his task force, which is... All centred on a very, very cool carrier. A very cool carrier, the Lexington. You gotta love the Lexington. We're supposed to be backed up by an Anzac squadron. But the Anzac squadron's fuel supply was inadequate and they couldn't accompany the TF-11. They couldn't accompany them. So, basically, the Anzac ships aren't there. Doesn't have their extra fire support. And he knows there are quite a lot of forces concentrating in the Rabul area, including a lot of aircraft. A huge number of aircraft. And the closer he gets, the more in range of those aircraft he gets. Remember again, one of the really interesting things when you're talking about Force Z, uh, Force Z and its loss in the sort of South China Sea area. Is that the air, the bombers attacking them were at the end of their fuel supply, having been out searching for Repulse and Prince of Wales. And secondly, they are unescorted. Okay? Those bombers are unescorted. 
This is why it's often pointed out by pretty much anyone who's looked at the census goes, the British could have had any of their carriers still alive there, or sort of floating around service there, and that task force probably doesn't get hit. Because with those bombers being at the maximum extent of their fuel range, radar-controlled fighters, doesn't matter what those fighters are, they're not escorted, there's no fighters for them to have to deal with, they don't have to go and start dodging zeros, they just have to deal with Bettys. They can do that. And they can, if they can block up and take out those raids, in terms of stopping them being multi-aircraft attacks, make them down to single plane or single plane attacks coming in on the actual capital ships, if any, if they actually do decide to carry on through the, through the attacking, well, that makes it far easier for the capital ships to dodge them. So maybe they still get damaged, maybe they don't. But the odds of them actually getting enough hits to sink them becomes far, far lower, if not almost virtually impossible for it to actually be an outcome. You can't say it's impossible because we have to remember Hood was golden BB'd, all sorts of things happened during war. Sometimes the literally one in a trillion chance actually happens. And your per uh, your system, which works 99.99999% of the time, fails. Well, in this scenario, they do have fighters, they do have these sort of things, but they also know the closer they get to Rabul, the more and more aircraft are going to be available. Rabul is a center of Japanese infrastructure, of its defense, its strategy, its linchpin point of a lot of its operations in that area. In fact, Southeast Asia, pretty much. So, it's heavily defended. Actually, even going for it like they are actually succeeds because it means the Japanese shift even more forces and are even more conservative in their security of Rabul and even more worried about it. Which, again, any forces the Japanese are using to defend things means they don't have them to attack things. But... The operation, as it occurs, they get run into by some scout aircraft. About 17 bombers manage to get out to where the Americans are because they're not really being directed in because they're not close enough really to direct them in. They haven't got enough information really to direct them in. And so there's a running fight which ensues. It's a really interesting running fight, but pretty much what you have coming along with it is... Well, after Fack, Lieutenant Commander Fack, who of course is famous for the Fack Weave, and I think I have done a video about that on this channel. If not, there will be one coming up as a 60 second is short at some point. Because I'm going to go through some carrier fighter tactics in 60 second short, so I thought it might be a fun thing to add in as extras along with the uh, ongoing Jack Speak. So, pretty much 17. Mitsubishi G4M1 Betty Bombers uh, are sent off to try and attack Task Force 11. And what's really interesting about this fight is not just the way the Wildcats are employed and how well they do at trying to intercept and manage the Japanese attacks, and really they do really well. Far better than they should do, considering that some of the level of support they have going on and coordination and experience the Americans have in coordination this sort of thing. But they're doing really well. And shows the value of the exercise that they had in the interwar period. But it's also where you start to realise there is a very different enemy you're dealing with, because the Americans have to deal with something the British certainly never had to deal with in the Mediterranean. I'm trying to think of instances where it was like that and they really don't come up because, f for example, when you're dealing with the fourth Kotai's second Shutai or second sort of strike led by Lieutenant uh, Masuya Nakagawa, five and nine coming Betty's were shot down or cut out of formation during approach. Cutting out of formation is the exact thing which fighters are supposed to do. We in modern era obsess over killing the enemy fighter aircraft. Oh, the enemy attacking a bomber aircraft, etc. Doing that, cutting them out of formation so they're coming in solo, 
in the face of all the AA fire, in the face of the maneuvering ships, that is often enough, because often at that point most crews just click away and get out of there. You have a lot more confidence when you're attacking in a group than when you're attacking solo. And one of them, actually the leader of the attack, well, he doesn't so much get taken out or cut up, but actually decides to carry on. His aircraft, his aircraft, carries on attacking even after, even after his the rest of his strike has gone through. He's managed to regain control of his aircraft and attempts to crash directly onto Lexington's flight deck. Lexington puts the flight deck, puts the cat, uh, the cat turns the carrier exactly away from this aircraft coming in, and puts all speed on and every gun opens up on that aircraft and it's knocked out of the air roughly 75 yards astern of the carrier. This is years before Kamikaze comes in. And yet, it's actually one of the first operations where you've got these sort of strikes taking place and it's what the Japanese are doing. Why is there this idea? Why Today, uh, is he using his control, get, regaining control of the aircraft, not to try and limp home and save his crew so they can use the aircraft again, but using it to try and attack the enemy? Is it searching for an honorable death? What is it? Well, honestly, I'd say it's some extent the expectations of the Japanese officer class and quite a lot of the Japanese personnel. They have to do their best to fight the enemy. And whilst many, many will interpret that in the way of preserving their crew, getting their aircraft home, getting it fixed so they can attack again, there are always going to be some who interpret it differently. And this is something which is important to consider because mental self-image can guide a lot of what you do in combat. Mental self-image can be really critical. During the First World War, there was a period where even when you got parachutes given to air crew, there were some units which didn't believe in bailing out. Now, please note, that's not referring to the British or Allied forces. They don't seem to be equipped with parachutes because A, the weight of the parachute on the aircraft really did actually have a bearing at time, and B, the cockpit design didn't have the space for them. We're talking about German units, which actually did have parachutes, and some of their pilots did save, but they managed to have their lives saved. Hermann Goering is one of the most famous examples of someone who used a parachute to save his life when his aircraft went down. And there are all sorts of weird mythology about why the Allied planes didn't have them, but honestly it comes down to space in cockpit and the amount of the weight, etc. It just... The margins are such. It's absurd, really, compared to what happens and how, what we know about how things change as time goes on. Even the Germans, I don't think, used backpack sort of style parachutes. Had a different sort of way of stowing it inside the air in the aircraft, but um, not a hundred percent sure of that one. And they see them gets away, but there is another operation that comes up, and this is, of course, well, there's Wake and Marcus, which go off pretty much as expected. Let's be honest, Marcus is a wonderful example of we've hit. There was nothing there. <laughs> nothing there that can fight them back. And, it, you know, Marcus Island Raid is just evil because it's a thousand air miles from Tokyo, 600 miles from the Bonin Islands, which was one of the, again, another rebel, really, in terms of its, its importance and its location. And they're both very much situated inside Japanese-controlled waters. But the raids weren't just used to affect Japanese fixed installations. When we look at these operations, the invasion of Samuel uh, uh, Salimua Alley, the American carriers actually got close enough, they were actually able to interdict the invasions. So they were able to attack across the islands and hit the forces on the beaches as they were coming in, hit 
some of the forces offloading, delay Japanese operations, cause them significant issues. And this again, the use of a carrier, it gives them a great strategic mobility and a great ability to again show the Japanese, hang on, they weren't supposed to be there. It's again taking the strategic edge off the Japanese because they thought they could do this operation with minimum support. And they run into carrier operation. Yes, they still succeed. Yes, the invasion of Saloon Malay still goes fairly successfully. The Japanese win. But their losses, three transport ships sunk, a minesweeper sunk, a light cruiser, two destroyers, a mine layer, seaplane tender, transport, all da another transport all damaged. It's... It's nasty. It's nasty for them. And those losses are overwhelmingly due to the efforts of the carriers involved. Overwhelmingly due to their aircraft. Overwhelmingly. In fact, the raids sank or damaged two-thirds of the invasion transports employed. The fact that Japanese army transports casualties were not much higher was due to the fact that they had been close to shore and were able to beach themselves. Many of the damaged vessels were never really put back into proper service again. And it was a huge psychological impact on the Japanese. Two things. They hadn't been prepared for carriers to be in that region and secondly they didn't think the Americans would risk their carriers that much. This is all about building up, building up, building up the tension, building up the fear and some of these operations are sort of planned, some of these operations are reactions to what the Japanese are doing but whichever the case they, it is it's all about showing the Japanese they don't control the pace of combat or at least giving them the impression they no longer control the pace of conflict. They have started this conflict. They had control of it at the beginning, but these raids are taking it back. These raids are taking back the initiative. And that's really the important thing. Having the control of the pace of conflict, that makes a major difference. It makes a truly astronomical difference. And I know that's something I've kept reiterating in this video, and I've kept probably sounding a bit like a broken record, but it's important to put these operations in their context because they don't, on the face of it, look massive. And it's very easy to write them off as PR stunts. But they're not. And whilst you can try and write things off as PR stunts, very rare militaries want to do things, navies especially, which are for just the sakes of PR. It exposes too much risk. It costs too much in fuel, in time, in manpower you know, everything. It's just, it doesn't work for them. But if you can do something which is going to be a good PR hit at home, and is going to be an absolute psychological banger for the enemy to deal with, you do it. And all these strikes have been building up experience, building up time, and also to an extent distracting the Japanese. Let's be honest, what are all these previous strikes to do with? They're all south of Japan. So when the Doolittle raid comes in, and I do have a lovely plan here, coming in from, well, north, northeast, it's kind of not where they were expecting American carriers to be operating. It's kind of the Americans doing exactly the same to them as they did to Pearl Harbor. Only this isn't attacking Pearl Harbor. This isn't about attacking a naval installation. No, this is about attacking Tokyo. This is about attacking the very heart of Japan. This is about embarrassing leadership. This is what you're doing here. You are not just going to hit them. You are going to embarrass them. Any actual military damage you do with the limited bomb loads you are carrying in the Doolittle Raid are going to be far outweighed by the embarrassment, the outrage, the hurt you cause Japan. Especially their leadership. 
And all this has been building up, building up, building up, and now this. You have attacked islands which were in their zone of control. Islands which they fought secure. You have attacked everything which they believe, but home is still safe. And now you're going to show them that home isn't even safe. And pretty much from this operation onwards, you can argue that a lot of Japanese strategy and a lot of their wider operations and sensible things they could have necessarily done don't doesn't happen because they are focused on the impact and the effect of these operations. Not the reality of the American capability at the time. Americans take years to build up to be actually able to do a lot of these things consistently. But the Japanese are prepared for them all the time and preparing for them constantly and worrying about them constantly. Look at all the forces which stay home in Japan. Think about where, what they could have been used for. Think about all those tanks, all those fighters, everything that's in Japan long before there are regular air raids, etc. on Japan. And yes, you need some of the forces there for defence, but... It's it's a real problem for the Japanese after these operations. It's a real problem for them. They were not expecting such attacks to happen so quickly. Now, this all leads to, of course, what is, in effect, probably reaching inside the enemy's psyche and picking out the worst nightmare they didn't realise they already had. Because it was that unthinkable for them. Yes, Roosevelt had spoken to the Joint Chiefs of Staff in 27th of December 1941, demanding that Japan should be bombed as soon as possible to boost public morale after Pearl Harbor. That's pretty much it. He demands it. And yet, it's not actually done, as said. To the 18th of April 1942, there's a lot of build-up work which happens beforehand. And there's a lot of selection work that goes into selecting the correct bomber that can carry enough bombs and actually do the required range. In fact, it was felt that the aircraft would need a cruising range of 2,400 nautical miles with a 2,000 pound, that's 910 kilogram, bomb load. That's a lot. In fact, once you start looking through the stats of what's required, you very quickly realise that this has been written to guarantee it's going to take time. Involving Doolittle, involving all sorts of specialists, and credit for the attack is given to Francis S. Lowe, the Assistant Chief of Staff for Anti-Submarine Warfare in the US Navy, um, suggesting to King... Admiral King on 10th of January 1942 that twin engine army bombers could be launched from an aircraft carrier this is after he'd observed some operations taking place at uh, Naval Station Norfolk Chambersfield in Norfolk he felt it was possible after looking and seeing what could take place he thought what was possible Originally, they planned to land in Vladivostok, which would allow them to land fairly stably, but uh, no, it was decided they needed to land in China, in China because, well, the Soviet Union technically had a neutrality pact with Japan. Remember, that same pact was the reason why the Soviet Union waits to invade Poland. They don't want to invade Poland until they're sure of neutrality with Japan who they've just been beating in a bit of a land war. But the thing is, as the Soviet Union would quite happily tell anyone, the that was at the very end of the logistics trail, and while their forces were all concentrated in that direction, they couldn't be in any way near the German border. And while Stalin believed in the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, quite a large volume of his own government and military hierarchy had about as much faith in that piece of paper as they had in the tensile strength of a toilet paper roll. A not a lot. Not a lot indeed. So, 
they go ahead of it. And they have to do all sorts of interesting things to those to the aircraft, as I discussed in live, to actually make it viable. But what's really interesting is the fact that when they launch at a little over 600 nautical miles, uh, they get the skull when they're 650 nautical miles away, and they uh, take a little while to get going and get started. So it's reduced down from 650 nautical miles away from their targets. But that's roughly 170 nautical miles further from Japan than they planned to launch. So they had planned roughly, I would say, roughly to launch at roughly 450 nautical miles away from Japan. Which is about 150 nautical miles further away than they could have launched at the maximum using traditional carrier aircraft. So that would have given the B-26 is a lot more range and a lot more capabilities in that regard, but it's still possible. It's still doable. And these aircraft go and they bomb sites in Japan. They bomb 10 military industrial targets in Tokyo, two more in Yokohama, one in Yokosuka, Nagoya, Kobe, and Osaka. So they hit six cities. They hit 16 targets, each bomber carrying three high-explosive and one fuel-explosive bomb. And for these 16 targets to be hit, for the massive psychological damage to be wrought on the Japanese, the Americans have 15 B-25s destroyed, one B-25 interned in the Soviet Union, three personnel killed outright eight captured four of whom lived to be rescued and four died in captivity three of those were executed and one by disease we think what did the Japanese lose physically Physically, well, the Ryu was damaged and it's pro uh, while it was in the process of conversion. That's going to be a new aircraft carrier they're waiting on. Uh, they had some patrol boats sunk. They had some sailors captured by that. The Americans claimed to shoot down free aircraft while on the operation. Uh, it's unlikely. The Kwasakai K-61 Hien were not bad fighter aircraft. In fact, the Americans actually mistake them for ME-109s. They're not ME-109s. They're a very different aircraft. But, uh, you know, this is one of the traditions of World War II is that the Japanese are constantly accused of being copying and derivative of everyone else when they have their own ideas. They have a limited industrial system, but that's due to size and access to raw materials more than anything else. The Japanese have roughly 400 injured, including civilians, and 50 killed. So, in actual military value, the Doolittle Raid achieves very limited results. In terms of national public relations and public opinion, it's a colossal, colossal boost. In terms of Japanese psychology and how they fight the war. When you start to look at the way they pursue operations, the way they evaluate operations, the way they, uh, they assign forces, and how they concentrate resources in terms of construction and focus on research and development, after this, it has a pivotal impact. The Japanese could never have won World War Two. I mean... With the resources they had, they couldn't have. There's, there's just too much of a disparity. It's like when you start, people start doing disparate claims between Britain and Germany, and they go, "Yeah, Germany could win against Britain." And you sort of go, "Well, you're talking about Britain or the British Empire?" And even Britain itself, there is a huge problems with that scenario, because 
Germany hasn't really focused its infrastructure and hasn't developed itself properly. In fact, they weren't even thinking war was going to happen in 1939. That's Hitler's gamble. The odds are they were thinking the 1940s, hence Plan Z, just as the Italians were thinking 1940s, and they have a lot of infrastructure, a lot of things they want to build up before they actually have a war. And that's against the Western powers that they perceive them, not the Western powers as they themselves are developing themselves into. France being the obvious issue, because as much as France is developing itself, they're still obsessed with fear of their own army. And you can understand that, considering their history of their own army, but, you know, it's a problem. You know, it, it's just the reality of the geographical and the development of the nations at the time, in terms of their industrial complex mass. Their mass of their industrial complex. So, Japan never really has a chance. But, Japan could have probably fought a very different war if they hadn't been forced so much into a defensive mindset by this operation. Because, remember, they start this war because of fear. Fear that America is going to erase Japan. Fear that their culture is going to be erased. Fear that they as a people are going to be erased. This goes back to... Well, it goes back to the way American-Japanese relations began with the Americans forcing over in Japan. There are fors and against and it's and all sorts of things, but that... And the fact is, there were other powers who were willing to do that and who were heading to do it, but they didn't get there before the Americans did, so the Americans get the credit, but also get the negative of it. The Americans therefore become enemy numero uno. They become the great evil that the Japanese are scared of, in many ways, because of that initial interaction. And it doesn't matter the reality of it. Okay? It doesn't matter what relations are like afterwards. It's always there in the back of their minds. And then when you have the competition growing, you have the way the Americans handle some of the relationship and some of the conversations with the Japanese. And the Japanese are always a bit weird for everyone to treat them because in a, a world where a lot of people and a lot of nations ascribe to not even a racial, but a cultural superiority complex. The Japanese are weird. They're not a Western nation. Let me use that phrase. Sort of, they're not a European-inspired, Western-style nation. And yet, they are at the big table. They are a very different... And they're not like China, which has basically fallen apart. And they're not like the other countries involved in the scenario. They are this nation... And Powers, many powers don't know how to talk to them. Don't actually bother studying them enough to actually know how to talk to them. And that creates all sorts of problems. That really does create all sorts of problems. But the thing is, Japan has this already perception that America is coming for them, that they will be destroyed by America. They've seen what's happened to other countries which have been occupied by the great powers. They, they fear that. And now the Americans have actually attacked them again. They've hit at their hearth. They've hit at their hearth. They've hit at their home. That forces almost a really defensive mindset on the Japanese. They suddenly become very much preoccupied with security of the home islands. And that is reflected, therefore, in how they deploy all sorts of forces. So the results, yeah, these raids have a massive impact. They dictate the pace of conflict. They force you know, uh, Isokuro, Isoroku Yamato, Yamamoto to up the pace of his own operations, leading to, I would argue, Coral Sea and Midway taking place at the time they do, in the way they do, with... Not as much preparation as the Japanese really would have preferred, if you consider their preparation for operations such as Pearl Harbor versus their preparations for those operations. It also forces, forces Japan to start committing a huge amount of their force and strength to home defense. And start thinking along those lines. 
even before they're losing the war, while they're, this is happening while they're still winning the war, if you're looking objectively, the Japanese are on the advance everywhere. They are advancing, and yet they are also psychologically retreating and defend, trying to defend, and trying to defend in many ways the indefensible. Their, their whole perimeter island plan is is not really a war, a long war scenario. It's a short war scenario. It's a tripwire system. So, these strikes achieve what they set out to. They really do. So, what's this... this... question, the question for this video, for this topic? Well, I had an interesting thought while going through this. I had a really interesting thought. Looking at the Japanese operations and the American operations. And whilst I thought I could ask, well, what, how do you think such a, a mass carrier operation could have would have worked if it had been carried out earlier? Would it have had the same impact? What would have happened? But pretty much, if you look at the way their forces are balanced, mm, there there is not a good option for the Japanese in that front. So, what is the other question option? Well, it's this: these operations were broadly speaking successful. The task forces did run into some opposition. Famously, the action of Bougainville. Bougainville. And what happens if they had run into more opposition? What happens if, let's say, the Doolittle raid, when before they launched, with Hornet still had deck full of B 25s, so she can't launch anything else, she can't use her air group, it's entirely dependent on Enterprise to protect her. What happens if that group is attacked by some Congos? If suddenly two or three Congos come steaming out of the night at them? With a whole attendant of the destroyers and cruisers launching long range torpedoes? What happens to American operations if one of those forces actually gets attacked and sunk? Because there is some interesting operations. There are some really interesting operations, and all of them are quite high risk in their own way. And if they had stumbled across such a force, they could have been in real trouble if they hadn't expected it. A multi-carrier formation stumbling into do little force, well, Enterprise would have had to defend both carriers. Her air group would have been solely responsible for the defense, and that's something which could have been overwhelmed if the Japanese had managed the coordination as they were capable of doing. But also running at night into some capital ships? Let's be honest, that's a nightmare for the Americans. Especially in early 1942. So, what do you think would have happened? How do you think that would have affected the American operations? I've enjoyed it. And uh, what have we got coming up? Well, next week. Next week is conception, operation, and conclusion of the uh, Europa and Giuseppe Maraglia, the Italian seaplane carriers. They're good ships. They really are. Thank you very much for watching. Hope you enjoyed the video. If you'd like to support the channel because you'd like to see more videos like this and more videos coming up, and I, I'm always happy to produce more videos and doing them more, there is Patreon, there is Ko-fi, and there is memberships where you can subscribe and support the channel. And Yes, this channel is entirely dependent on your support. It is. It's a really cool system, actually, for modern academia, I find. I find it far better than... I think I've said this in several videos, I think. I'm really... Now I'm used to it, I find it a far more pleasant system to use than modern academia, with writing up applications for funding, and then having to jump through lots of hoops, and then never getting the funding. Whereas this way, I show what I can do, I say I'll do more of it, please support the channel, and... If people want to, they support the channel. If they don't, they don't. And I don't get the all the lovely letters of rejection which come through the other way. And if you just like to support the channel, instead of financially, but with your support, there's liking, sharing, and subscribing. Those really do matter in getting history out to more people, in being able to achieve wider circulation. Sharing and liking and subscribing... They are incredibly valuable. 
to any YouTuber, any person who produces content on YouTube, whether they're historians or... Who's the person that showed up the other week? I kept having... Yeah, I, for a couple of days, a couple of weeks ago, I had Rin Penrus, who's a VTuber, keep showing up as one of the accounts that are the third most popular account that my, people who were watching my videos were watching. And I decided it was, when I narrowed down, it was all down to short content and short overlap. And I decided there must be something in the logarithm which goes, ah, these people like a British accent, so we're going to show them another bit YouTuber with a British accent and doing that overlap. But anyway, yeah. Right. It doesn't matter if you're a VTuber, historian, or any other forms of YouTuber I can think of. No, they're all historians as well. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, those the people who do, I suppose, martial artists, theoretically, but they often do medieval reactment with swords and are showing that, so that's a form of historian. This is the problem with being a historian. You can, you can take over so much by saying it's just another form of historian. There are so many forms. There are some philosophers out there who I watch. And, of course, legal channels, but again, legal is often history, because let's be honest, it's the history of law, which is the history of human civilization, really. So, yeah, that's just another form of historian. They, they might call themselves lawyers, but they're, they're, just, another, they're just a subgroup of historians, really. Um, I'm just I'm, I'm trying to think of it. No, no, just as far as I can think of moment, it's historians and VTubers. Please, tell below, say below if there's more than that. That's all I can see. Historians and VTubers. Take care.